He says in several places that the planet would be better off without these people. You'd better not be gay, or you wouldn't even be able to join the Sea Org at this point. It was like a, a moment of like my heart, like just wanted to die. I knew that I had to be perfect. I knew that now I had this status in Scientology um, as the youngest clear. If I wasn't perfect, that I was going to ruin it for the church. I was going to ruin it for my parents. If you think North Korean re-education camp with hard labor thrown in, you kind of more or less there. That's more or less what it was like. He says in several places that the planet would be better off without these people, and they should be removed from public life, and watch public life get a lot better once they're gone, because they are covertly hostile. You can't trust them. You better get them away from you. When you're dedicating your life to clearing this universe of evil, you don't have a life because that's, that's forbidden. Scientologists believe that LGBTQIA are all covertly hostile. All they want to do is destroy. All they want to do is stop good things from happening. Now, look inside your heart. Is that what you think you are? Or did L. Ron Hubbard just say that so he could protect his own stuff? The question in this case is whether a church of Scientology can be lawfully registered as a place of worship where a legally valid ceremony of marriage can be performed. The answer of the court is that it can. In December 2013, the Church of Scientology won a case in the UK's Supreme Court allowing them to perform religious wedding ceremonies at their London church at 146 Queen Victoria Street. The ruling redefined religion in British law and paved the way for Louisa Hodkin and Annie Calcioli to become the first UK couple to be married legally in a Scientology ceremony. Although now officially recognised as a place of religious worship, the Church of Scientology opted out of the decision to conduct same-sex marriages and to this day will only perform ceremonies that involve one man and one woman. In Scientology, we use the word Thetan. The term Thetan is taken from the Greek letter Theta, which has long served as a symbol for thought or spirit. It isn't something you have. You wouldn't say, my Thetan. You'd simply say, me. You have a body. You have a mind. You are a Thetan. In Dianetics, Aaron Hubbard writes that one has an analytical mind, responsible for rational thinking and logic, and a reactive mind, the cause of stress, fears, and illness. Your reactive mind is what is holding you back in life, and the goal of Scientology is to get rid of it, known as reaching the state of clear. As a child, Nora Ames was declared the world's youngest clear. She was an example of the perfect Scientology child, and went on to join the elite Sea Organization, dedicating her life to the church. However, there was a problem. If, if I was gay in that moment, that meant that I possibly wasn't really clear, um, that I had lied during all that auditing and everything else, um, which had cost my parents a tremendous amount of money and everything, um, you know, and also that, you know, like I was saying Scientology was a lie. I mean, nobody at the, in school knew what it meant, but, you know, like I felt like I was like this example of Scientology's perfection. Scientologists believe they are on a mission to clear the planet and that the words of their founder, L. Ron Hubbard, cannot be changed or altered in any way. It 
it's it, in no uncertain terms. They are massively against um, the gay. My name is Claire Headley. Um, I spent 30 years in Scientology from birth to 30. I spent 14 of those years in the Sea Organization and eight of those years in Religious Technology Center, which is the highest ecclesiastical organization in Scientology that is run directly by David Miscavige. They don't accept anyone as gay or lesbian or anyone from any of those communities because they can't, because Hubbard says those people are evil, and that has not changed. Hubbard's labeling of the LGBTQ plus community is extremely demeaning, belittling. Hubbard says over and over again, those people are evil. They need to be cured with Scientology, quote unquote. I mean, it's it's despicable. The um, But that is the rhetoric. My name is Kate Bornstein. And I was a Scientologist for 12 years, starting in 1970 up into 1982. The Commodore, L. Ron Hubbard, was case supervisor on my auditing for a while. He personally was doing that. It was paradoxical. It, it really was because it was amazing. It was like working with jesus christ or buddha or this is the man who had everything and he was big and fat he had bad teeth and horrible breath and it just just he was mean and angry most of the time I mean, when he wasn't angry, he would be, he was swell. He would tell lovely stories, um, but he was a really mean man. And that, that's what I, I got from working closely with him on FLAG. Their, their teachings, L. Ron's words, um, specifically state this. I mean, he was excruciatingly homophobic. Um, in, in whether or not we can dis, dismiss this by saying, you know, he grew up at a different time. He's from the 20s. He's from, you know, the early 1900s and blah, 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 blah. Like, I don't really care. Like, the man was disgustingly homophobic. He taught thousands of people um, that who they are internally is wrong and demonic and that they should not exist on planet earth. And that's, those are just facts. Um, and they have never, uh, changed the teachings, uh, to reflect current times. They, you know, um, have tripled down on it and have funded multiple anti-gay measures and have backed anti-gay candidates, uh, all across the country. So that's, that's just what they do. Scientologists believe that emotions can be measured on what is called the tone scale. L. Ron Hubbard taught that gay people are one one on this scale, also known as covert hostility. At this level, people are spiraling downwards in life and actively try to prevent the success of others. You know, Hubbard sets up his emotional tone scale chart, his, his chart of emotional tones. And he says anything below 2.0 is heading in the direction of succumb and death and destruction. Anything below 2.0 is behavior and activity and emotions and thoughts dictated and directed by the reactive mind. So they're not rational. And Scientology can fix such behavior and thoughts and emotions and reactions by getting rid of the reactive mind through auditing. Well, he puts being gay at 1.1 on the tone scale. That's covert hostility. He puts any gay homosexual activity as perverted behavior, but basically perverted pedophiles. People who are at 1-1 are the most dangerous elements of society. And at some point in science of survival, he says all the society would be better if all such people were rounded up and quietly disposed of without sorrow. And he says it's only the social norms that would prevent such a solution from basically being carried out. But that if it was culturally acceptable to do such a thing, it would be very beneficial for society. That's literally what the guy says.
Former high-ranking executive Debbie Cook testified in a sworn statement that church leader David Miscavige once forced her to wear a sign around her neck labelling her lesbian as an act of punishment. She also spoke of two other senior officials, Guillaume Nazerve and Mark Yeager, being physically beaten after they were accused of being gay. It was demanded that they confess to being homosexuals and having homosexual activity between the two of them. And then they were beaten? Yes, they were beaten. Scientology's treatment of anyone who's gay in the Sea Org, it would just be that it's pretty much tantamount to committing a suppressive act. So, I mean, in the story with Debbie Cook, her having a sign around her neck that said lesbian wasn't even because of anything she'd ever confessed to or been found guilty of. It's just considered a disgusting insult in Scientology to genuinely think or call someone gay. So that that was just literally just to demean her. That had nothing to do with her. The same thing with Guillaume Lacerve and Mark Yeager. I think Miscavige is quoted as saying, the only expansion either of them have ever caused was in each other's assholes. Which is a pretty funny insult, I got to be honest. I give him points for that. Um, but that's not because of anything they've ever done. You understand, these two have never had any history of homosexuality with each other or otherwise. It's just Miscavige's idea of the worst way to insult somebody. He often accuses people of, oh, this guy is gay, go get him interrogated. And we're talking about executives who are married to uh, they have wives. You know, there's no reason that David Miscavige would take it into his brain that they have this going on other than that's just who he is and that's what he does. And he does not accept anyone um, in that community at all. It's gotten a whole lot worse. I mean, I was there, you know, while Hubbard was alive and I left right before uh, David Miscavige, the current big chief, took over, and he's gotten a whole lot worse. You'd better not be gay, or you wouldn't even be able to join the Sea Org at this point. You better not have had a gay relationship anywhere in your life. You're not able to join the Sea Org. Um, and then it's don't ask, don't tell, but they do ask. And if you leave, they tell. So. Scientologists believe that life is divided into eight dynamics, or urges towards survival. The second dynamic is sex, family, and relationships, and being attracted to the same sex is considered anti-survival. This is known as being out 2D. To know life. You have to know the parts of life. These are the dynamics of existence. To know them is to know life itself. When you actually look at what Aaron Hubbard says and teaches and, and wrote, it is so clear. It's not just a, it's looked down upon. Like, in Dianetics, the first book in Scientology that is meant to be the most important one that it's all based off, um, he literally says uh, a someone who's homosexual or lesbian or falls into that category is a sexual pervert and that it is a mental illness and that needs to be cured. What was it like for you growing up in Scientology as someone that identifies now as gay? Because... I know you've told your story before and so yeah. on, but I want to focus specifically on this because it's it's a very important topic. And I think I want to get that point across to people what what that journey was like for you emotionally and mentally, because you have to come to terms with being who you are and coming out of the closet and all this sort of stuff like yeah. every, like people do that. But then couple on top of that, the suppression and the shame and the guilt that Scientology, mm. it must have been really tough for you. Well, I think it was tough for two reasons. A, um, and I try to remind my kids of this like every day, it generationally, it was a hard time period because I grew up um, in the 80s, early throughout the entire 80s and 90s, early 90s, right? So that was like my coming of age time because I was born in 1976. So that time period, everyone has to understand because you got to rewind the clock. You know, being gay now is like 
a, a fucking Glee episode. Okay. Um, you know, it's, it's very different. Um, my growing up, there were no gay icons everywhere. Um, we did not have gay characters on every single television show. It was, it was definitely forbidden. It was bad. Um, you know, so it wasn't, um, like now where it's, it's normal things for me were just very confusing. Um, you know, in my household, my mom kind of gave me quasi free reign to do things that I wanted. There's always that you got to wear dresses, you got to put on the patent leather shoes, but like I wanted to be my dad as a kid. So I would stand with him and like pretend to shave my face. And like, I was always doing like what's considered boy stuff and like, you know, trying to cut my hair all short all the time. And like my mom never wanting me to do that, you know? Um, and so like the things that I fought hard for, um, were really hard because it would get squashed a lot, you know, especially in the eighties, because I grew up at a time where people were always asking me like, are you a boy or a girl? I didn't hit puberty until I was like 14 and a half, which is my freshman year in high school. So that question, are you a boy or a girl was asked of me like all through middle school. So I would like force myself into these situations where I would be like, okay, well, I'm just going to go kiss this boy. Although it was like more like to get the attention of my friends who were girls and it was a way to be like them. And then we could all talk more, but really, you know, I was thinking about them, you know, and just sort of like trying to fit in. And, you know, I mean, I was dressing more like my boyfriends than I was like my girlfriends. I just remember like when we had to go in PE, you know, everything being very awkward. You have to change all the time and stuff, you know, just stuff like that. And just trying to shove it down thinking, you know, oh, I'm just shy, like mm, just shy. I'm over here shy, but I'm not like everywhere else in life. I'm like, Hey, you know, and I'm like, oh, I'm just trying to just very shy. Like, <laughs> And, you know, and I just couldn't talk about it because ultimately I knew how my dad felt. I knew how the rest of society felt. There were a few gay kids um, who were getting bullied relentlessly. Um, and the word gay itself was like, that was a slur, you know, like, oh, that's so gay. All my life, I had been pretending to be a boy and a man, watching other boys and men, trying to figure out how to do it. And there I was, a woman. And I realized there I was, watching other women, trying to figure out what to do. And that woman wasn't as fulfilling an identity any more than man was. And that was dark night of the soul time, you know, not man, not woman. What the hell are you? And there's a word for it today. I didn't think up the word. Someone really smart thought up the word non-binary. Uh, for years, I called myself a not man, not woman. Now people call themselves non-binary. Kind of cool. And here I am. It was definitely not something that I wanted to be. Um, at one point, um, my, my quote unquote best friend in high school, because I went to a public school, um, we got into a nasty fallout over Scientology. Actually, if I was gay in that moment, that meant that I possibly wasn't really clear, um, that I had lied during all that auditing and everything else, um, which had cost my parents a tremendous amount of money and everything. Um, you know, and also that, you know, like I was saying Scientology was a lie. I mean, nobody at the, in school knew what it meant, but you know, like I felt like I was like this example of Scientology's perfection. Despite this childhood trauma, Nora suppressed her feelings and carried on progressing in life. She later joined the Sea Organization, an elite paramilitary group of Scientology's most devout followers. Signing a one billion year contract dedicating not just this lifetime, but all future lives to the church, Nora was a fully committed Scientologist. According to former spokesperson Mike Rinder, you are not qualified to join the Sea Organization if you are gay. Executive positions in any Scientology organization require that you have no history of perverted 2D activities, and that most definitely includes homosexual acts. To clarify, he says, 
you are not qualified to join the Sea Org if you have an extensive history of homosexual acts, even if you claim you're not gay. There is a, a zero tolerance policy in the Sea Org for anything gay. And that probably is one of the best sort of um, litmus tests for what does Scientology really feel about the LGBT community. It's almost like, okay, you, you're going to let Catherine Bell be her celebrity self and, and live her life and leave her alone. But you have a zero tolerance policy for it in your innermost circle, the, the people who are most dedicated to working for Scientology. The fact of the matter is, is that Scientology considers anyone in the LGBTQ plus community as someone to be cured. And the same would be true if a member of the C organization um, expressed that they were LGBTQ plus, um, they would expect to quote, handle that and no longer have those quote unquote impulses. I mean, all of it is hate rhetoric <laughs> is the bottom line. There's no other, there's no other answer or explanation. Um, they're just expected to be handled. And as a, a member of the C organization, even more so, they are expected to quote unquote, knock off case on post. What does that mean? Well, that means don't, don't be acting out on your impulses that are quote unquote, non-survival, but instead uh, do as is expected of you and perform as is expected of you. And anything else is considered that you are an evil person and trying to say, quote unquote, Scientology doesn't work, which of course is a crime. So what was it like when, when you were in the Sea Org, you've committed your life to Scientology and you've had this experience already and you know deep down that you're having these feelings or you've had these feelings and you're saddled with all this guilt and the trauma of being at school. What was that experience like for you, particularly in the context of being one of the most dedicated Scientologists on the planet? That's it's worse because the more, you know, the worse it gets. You just keep breaking your brain over and over and over. And so like, that's, that's how it was being the gay. It's like, you just are like, well, if I'm gay and I can't be the gay because it means I am literally worse than somebody who's murdered someone or someone who has evil intentions towards L. Ron Hubbard, or somebody who's stolen all the money from an org, then, you know, um, uh, maybe I will just pack that up and put it away and try really, really hard to move forward. And then um, if that doesn't work, uh, you know, I don't know what. I will probably have to die. But if I can, you know, live another day and not be the gay, then I'm doing something right. But if I keep thinking these thoughts, then, you know, it means everything that they're saying about me is right. And every time I do something wrong, it means that those things that are everything that they say that's evil is right. And every time something goes wrong, it's my fault. It was always um, like this big no, no, if anyone even hinted that um, their sexuality was anything other than heterosexual. And so for example, you know, one, one instance that comes to mind was there were two adult male staff um, at the Scientology headquarters and they they had started a relationship um behind you know behind closed doors um and uh not only was it not authorized you know they like they would never have even been allowed to get married had they even asked you know it was just not even a question um and so i i i'm not you know they were put on heavy manual labor interrogations etc and you know endeavored to be quote unquote cured of their homosexual relationship as a scientology staff member your success and well-being depends on your production 
Every worker is assigned at least one statistic, from book sales to toilets cleaned, with results plotted on a weekly graph. For reasons unknown, the week starts on Thursdays at 2pm, and failure to produce a rising statistic can lead to harsh penalties known as the ethics conditions. If your statistic is up, you are afforded ethics protection, but the moment your stat falls, you face punishments ranging from losing pay to restricted dining privileges, meaning a diet that consists solely of rice and beans. Persistent falling stats will land you in the Rehabilitation Project Force, Scientology's prison camp where members are subjected to hard manual labour, repeated interrogations and expected to sleep on the floor. The Rehabilitation Project Force is a concentration type, slave camp type, complete reprogramming effort by Scientology. Um, it includes um, being restricted to a very small group. Like when you're on the Rehabilitation Project Force, you do not even have um, the allowance to be able to speak to anyone else not on that program. Uh, you do heavy manual labor, you're to run everywhere, um, and then five, five hours a day, you're interrogated for your evil purposes that are causing you to um, behave and act the way you are. You stay in here and you stay just like, you stay here. You just like make yourself teeny tiny and it's really, really hard. That's it. That's your only focus is Thursday at two. Everything is for that everything and what's ironic about that is you're never ever focused on all mankind or this sector of the universe until you're at an event until you're at the big haza gaza where you know little tiny man walks up in his little big boy suit to like be like look at us look at me look at my pompadour and like you know look at all the great things we're doing blah, blah, blah. and then you know then we're like oh we're fabulous yay and then you go back to thursday two thursday two thursday two thursday two thursday two and that's it and that's your fucking grind although the church states publicly that it is lgbtq plus friendly and allows anyone to pay for and participate in introductory services the upper levels of spiritual enlightenment, known as the Operating Thetan, or OT levels, are strictly offered by invitation only. So Scientology recognizes it's bad PR to be known as being anti-gay. So I think they're allowing people like Catherine Bell, Brooke Daniels, there are a couple other examples that are just escaping me right now. They're sort of allowing them to exist in the Scientology ecosystem so that they can point to them as examples of how, oh, we're not anti-gay. And you go, okay, but you have to look under the hood a little bit and understand that you're going to accept their money, uh, but you won't allow them to go up the bridge because until they're no longer gay, there's still something wrong with them. Scientology's view on LGBTQ plus is one of complete non-acceptance. Um, they do not accept that someone would normally have those impulses. They don't expect or accept um, any relationship other than heterosexual as acceptable within Scientology. If they say that at the outset, it's simply to lure um, such a person in the door and then they'll proceed with their quote unquote deprogramming attempts to cure that. It is generally considered that the state of clear is what is what is supposed to fix everything that's wrong with you personally. And so, you know, in present day Scientology, if someone is openly gay, they will not, generally not be allowed to progress past the state of clear. There are some examples, John Travolta being one of them, where Scientology will say, okay, if you will just stop being gay during your next OT level, we'll let you do the next OT level. <laughs> And of course you go, well, you can't stop being gay. And they're like, well, if you just won't do any gay shit while you finish your next OT level, we'll let you do your next OT level. It doesn't change the fact that being gay in Scientology is considered something that is wrong with you, needs to be fixed, and only Scientology can fix it. And that as long as you are someone who um, practices that, or whatever word Scientologists would use, you are... Uh, one of the most dangerous elements of society. Those are L. Ron Hubbard's explicit words. And that is absolutely how Scientologists think, how they feel, what they believe. Um, 
even if they will deny it in public forums. What would you say to someone who is currently in Scientology that is going through this LGBTQ plus journey and maybe having these doubts or whatever their situation is? What would you say to someone in that situation? Honestly, I would say, first of all, please don't keep giving Scientology your money because the the auditing and the processing, A, um, you're not going to go fully OT. That's, that's number one. No matter what is being told to you, um, no matter what promises they've made, um, the policies and the writings of L. Ron Hubbard are not going to change. The words that he wrote in Dianetics and Science Survival and everywhere else are the philosophy of Scientology. That is, that is what stands. That is what they believe. They believe that homosexuals, anyone in the LGBTQIA plus um, banner exist only at 1.1, that there is no other tone level for um, us. Okay. So no matter what they say to your face, they believe that unless you stop being the gay, you are 1.1. And you, unless you like at some point during one of these sessions that you're getting completely renounce that and decide I am the straight and I've got a straight partner and you marry a, a heterosexual partner and procreate and do that to prove it, you will forever be the gay. And however, asterisk, because you were the gay, um, that is in your folder forever and you will never go OT. Anyway, even if you do all that, you are a, a scarlet letter in Scientology. Um, and, uh, your partner will be marked even if you did go straight. <laughs> um, and, uh, they're just taking your money. They will take your money forever, forever that I promise you. Also, um, I can tell you now being out of Scientology for 20, almost 20 years now, um, there is a glorious life and community outside of Scientology um, that is plentiful and wonderful uh, that exists where you can find spiritual fulfillment um, that does not cost tons of money uh, and also can give you that, uh, fill that void to need to help other people and also to find your way spiritually. Cause I do understand that. I do understand the need to understand yourself and want to discover what it is that's going on inside all of us, because I, 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 I get it. I get it. Um, but Scientology is not going to give you that pathway and they do not love you. They do not want you. Um, they do want your money and your time. Okay, but don't give them either of those things because they don't deserve it and don't change for them um, because uh, it's just going to lessen who you are. That's what I would say. I would say, darling, I'm 75 years old and I'm strange as strange can be. But all I want for you is love. All I want for you is to be able to love as you wish, wherever you wish, whenever you wish. That's what I want for you. And when you come up against stuff in Scientology that goes, nah, no, that doesn't make sense or that's it. Keep tally. Keep tally. They're going to build up those things. And out here, there isn't that kind of pressure to conform. 
There are places, yeah, but you can get away from those. You know, I did. Got totally got away from it. Went to San Francisco. Wow, spent six years there in the queer capital of the world. Ah, it was heaven. It was heaven. And again, I'm old. Think of me as your auntie. And really, all I want for you is love. Scientology, absolutely. Uh, you know, stop pretending that you love the gays because you don't. And I, and I encourage my last message is Laura Prepon. Like, I would love this is my challenge. If we could get Laura Prepon, now that she has officially said she is not sitting with Scientology anymore in the cafeteria of religion, I would love, love, love. For her to come on any of these channels, talk with Leah if she wants, talk with me, talk with A.A. Ron, talk with you, talk with somebody about, you know, being a paid professional lesbian on Orange is the New Black during her time as an active Scientologist, mind you, and what that was like and, you know, uh, what she has to say about that. And, um how she feels about uh, supporting a hate group and what she can do to make amends now. I would love, Laura, if you're listening, we, we would love to hear from you here in the gays and, um, you know, ex Scientologists would love to know what you're going to do now to, to fight back. So that's my challenge. In fact, if you hear celebrity Scientologists talking amongst themselves or talking at private events and they're talking about the dangers and the pitfalls of the entertainment community, I promise you, they're not talking about pedophilia. They're talking about just being gay. <laughs> Although they associate being gay with pedophilia. Do you see what I mean? So um, yes, uh, you, a Scientologist, a true believing celebrity Scientologist would really have a very difficult time. I almost want to say not be able to, but there's always an exception, not be able to actually be friends with another celebrity who's gay. They would never fully trust them because L. Ron Hubbard said being gay puts you at covert hostility on the tone scale and covert hostility is the most dangerous, insidious band of the tone scale. And there's just no way to separate those two things. You're gay means you're dangerous and insidious and only Scientology can maybe hopefully help you. How can you possibly have a trusting, close friendship with someone who you feel that way about? And if someone, if one celebrity Scientologist even was good friends with an openly gay celebrity, especially publicly, like always photographed out together, other Scientology celebrities would report that person to the president's office as some as as that person doing something that is contrary to the ideals of Scientology or painting Scientology in a bad light. I mean, just like we've heard the story of Leah Remini writing up Tom Cruise for jumping on Oprah's couch because she's like, he's acting a fool being a bad representation of Scientology. Right? <laughs> Behind the scenes, she was even trying to put Tom Cruise's ethics in. That is that is how Scientology celebrities would respond to someone who was openly supporting gay causes or openly supporting openly gay celebrities. Now look, someone could probably always find an exception or two to the rule, but like I've already given you an exception. Catherine Bell and Brooke Daniels are in an openly gay relationship and are considered Scientologists in good standing. That's an exception to the rule. So undoubtedly there's gonna be some exceptions to what I just said, but what I just said would be the rule, <laughs> you know. With all that pressure, saying you are a man you are a woman that's it you can't change and if you change you're evil and if you change we hate you uh, that's a lot of pressure for a little kid it's a lot of pressure for a grown adult but little kids can't take it very well and when we aren't actively doing something to dismantle the transphobia and homophobia that are being put into laws on both sides of the Atlantic and certainly into the Pacific as well. When we don't do anything about it, we're complicit. Um, people not only suffer, they kill themselves. 
L. Ron Hubbard's son, Quentin Hubbard. Sweetest guy I'd met in a long, long time. Genuinely a nice person. Was gay. I say was because he killed himself. And no one in Scientology is going to acknowledge that. So what's important about doing this? Because you don't know who needs it. The person right next to you might be in desperate need of your assistance in dismantling this stuff. Why Scientology? Because it's so blatantly evil when it comes to persecuting LGBTQIA people. My daughter is in the Sea Org. She's, as I'm speaking, and this is July 2023, she's commanding officer of CLO Africa, and Africa just won the birthday game. She's a big deal. Uh, Jessica Baxter's her name. If you see her, Please tell her dad loves her. That's, that's all. And I love you. I do. Of course I do. But you're a human being just like I am. Come on out. makes life a whole lot more worth living.